Yeah, thank you for that great special. What a lovely name, the name of Jesus. If you would take your Bibles this morning, we'll turn to uh, Joshua chapter 9. We'll be in verse 14. We'll read some of the same verses we read last week, but that'll be okay. Joshua chapter 9, verse number 14. What a lovely name, the name of Jesus. That's why we're here this morning. Jesus is a name above all other names. You know, there's no other name that every knee and every tongue shall bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's the name of Jesus uh, that is, has the power uh, that will make us, every one of us, you know, whether we, whether we want to, you know, the world, the world may not recognize the name of Jesus now, but there's a time when every knee shall bow before the name of Jesus, and every tongue will confess. Uh, we do it as Christians, we do it willfully and joyfully that Jesus Christ is the name of all, of other, above all other names. Uh, so uh, just hope you enjoy the name of Jesus this morning. I uh, hope you, you use it in a right way. We hear the world use it in the wrong way, but hope you use it in a right way to glorify God. If you would, uh, your verses this morning, Joshua chapter 9, verse 14, let's read that. And the men took, vic took, their, and the men took of their victuals, and asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. Let's pray. Almighty God, gracious Heavenly Father, we hum humbly come before thy throne this morning and ask for thy favor. We want to come before thee with praise on our lips. So we praise you for this day, the, the day that thou hast made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you for life and liberty, freedom, love, joy, and peace. We know that all goodness flows directly from thee, and we're so thankful. Help us this morning to focus on thee, on thy word, and to learn how to better follow the truths contained in thy holy and precious word. Bind the devil and every evil influence and distraction this morning as we invite thy Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts and minds. Help us to follow through on all that we would pledge to do from hearing thy voice. In Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. The title of the message this morning is Wait on God or sin will nose in. Wait on God or sin will nose in. In Joshua chapter 9, verses 14, the Bible says, And the men took of their victuals and asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. You know, every day we have decisions to make. Every day we make choices, and how we make those choices affect what happens in our lives. If we think about it, the decisions we make affect our future, and they are very important as to how we, uh, how we address each decision in our life. You know, the Bible, Joshua chapter 9, verse 14, the men took of their victuals and asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. How foolish it is when we decide to make decisions upon our own. We make decisions every day. According to Columbia Research, uh, they found that an average person makes about 70, 70 decisions per day. Think about that, 70 decisions per day. You know, the average person in, in a year makes 25,500 decisions each and every year. Over the course of a lifetime, if you live to be 70 years, that's 1,788,500 decisions you've made in your life, lifetime. And how we make those decisions affects our lives, the lives of our children, the lives of our families, the lives of our church, the lives of our countrymen. Uh, each decision is very vitally important. And here we see in Joshua chapter 9, verse 14, And the men took of their victuals and asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. You know, hurry, this morning I want to get one thing in your mind. Hurry is of the devil. The devil wants you to hurry. He wants you to hurry through life. He wants you to hurry through decisions. He wants you to hurry through everything that you do because those who hurry do not do things right. Many times we hurry through life. And when we hurry through decisions and through lives, many times we're not doing it the right way. We're not asking counsel at the mouth of the Lord. And how important it is, young people, that we understand when we are to make a decision, it should not be a hurry decision. We should take time to pray about it. No matter how small the decision, no matter how large the decision, we should have... We should not hurry through that decision without asking counsel at the mouth of the Lord. What does God have to say about it? Amen? Amen. An online article I read said, Hurry and scarcity is, common, is a common marketing tool. It's common because it is effective. Businesses know if they can get you to be in a hurry or if they can tell you there's a few limited supply that you might rush into a decision. And when you rush into a decision, many times you make the wrong decision. 
Many of us, we go into a store and something glitters because stores understand this. If we can get the packaging just right, if we can put it in the right place, if we can say wow on the package, uh, if we can say very few, limited, sale in soon, you only have a limited time, we'll look at that, we'll pick it up, we'll touch it, we'll feel it. And as we look at it and touch it and feel it, we go, I want this. And we don't take any time to determine, should I have it? A lot of times, we'll just go in and buy it, whether we have the money or not. Take a little plastic card, swipe it. Next thing you know, it's in your, it, it's in your house, and you've got it. You unwrap it. You take it out, and you're like, I really didn't want this. We call that buyer's remorse. How many of us had buyer's remorse? Pretty much anyone who's ever bought things has had buyer's remorse. You get something, you think you're getting something that you're not getting, and you get it home, you unwrap it, and it's not exactly what you expected. Fails your expectations, but you own it and you had to pay for it. Whether you paid cash for it, if you charged it, you got to pay for that later. Hurry and scarcity is, common, is a common marketing tool. It's common because it is effective. This offer ends Friday. Only five left in stock are examples of scarcity marketing. Scarcity marketing encourages you to make a quick decision, a quick buying decision. If you don't hurry, you have fear that you'll miss out. A lot of us do that, don't we? We think we're going to miss out, so we go ahead and make the decision and buy it. Many of our bankruptcy clients, this online article says, have gotten into too much debt because of scarcity marketing. They don't want to miss out on a great deal or a last-minute chance to get an item, so they buy things on credit that they can't really afford. When you add to the cost of interest and late fees, not to mention emotional stress and excessive, the excessive debt brings on, those items weren't worth buying in the first place. You see what this article is saying? This is reaching out to people who have gone bankrupt, trying to help them out. And it says, listen, if you would have thought before you made the purchase, you probably wouldn't have made the purchase in the first place, and you wouldn't have the problem that you have right now. Joshua 9, 14, the men took of their victuals and asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. You know, here the men of Israel were, well, I think they were wise men. I think they were smart men the men of Israel. Don't you think so? We, we remember the story from last week. Strangers came into the land. And the strangers came into the land and they said, we've come from such a long way that our clothes are worn and tattered, our sandals are old, our bottles are rent, our bread is moldy, our bread is dry. And what did the children of Israel do? The children of Israel, instead of learning the lesson that they should have learned from Ai, that listen, no matter how small the decision, we need to look to God and ask counsel at the mouth of the Lord so God can direct us in all our ways and in every step that we take, we understand that it's from God. But what they do, they did what we do. They decided, I'm going to look and I'm going to examine what's going on and we'll even call in some experts. And they, I think they called in some experts and they said, look at this bread. It is moldy. It's probably the moldiest dry bread we've ever seen in, in our life. Most of the time, bread's eaten. Well, here's some bread that's old, it's dry, it's moldy. That lines up with their story. Look at their clothes, and they examine their clothes, and they see all these cattered clothes, and the sandals are just wore out. They say, that lines up with their story. These bottles are broke. And look at the, look at the age of the bottles. Look at this glass. This glass is old. They may have brought in some super experts that examined the bottles and said, these are really old bottles. Their story completely lines up. Which is not wrong. There's nothing wrong with getting counsel, getting experts to look at things. But the men of Israel were looking and feeling and touching and examining, but they weren't waiting on God. They had not even bothered to acknowledge God in this decision. And it was costly. You know, are you looking? There's the big decisions, young people. There's big decisions that you're going to come to in life. Buying a house, a car, who to marry. Big decisions, right? School, what school to go to, what job to take. And I believe, I believe the bigger the decision, the more time we should take in prayer and in Bible study to understand what is God's will for our future. Because we need to know what God wants us to do. And it's okay to call the experts and say, what do you think? And ask the experts what they think. But ultimately, we need, we need to go to the one who, who knows the future, and that's God. Amen? Amen. What I'm trying to tell you this morning is we need to wait on God. We look with our eyes, we examine with our hands, we have an expert look at things, the house, the car that we're wanting to purchase. 
I think the Israelites were smart. I think they had experts look over the situation. And I think they were very careful to examine the evidence. But I don't care how expert you are, you don't know the future. God does. Doesn't he? I remember, you know, before we sold our house, I prayed about selling our house. And I said, Lord, if you, want, if you want us to sell this house, you'll sell it. And if you want us to buy a house, you'll help us to find the right house at the right time. And if you don't want us to sell this house, don't allow it to sell under any circumstances. Because God knows more than I know. When we went to buy a house, I called up an expert who came in and he looked at the foundation and he said, the foundation is good. He said, there's no termites. And he gave me a whole written report and I read through that report very carefully to see if there were any problems with the house I was looking to buy. But ultimately I was praying to God because God knew the future. He knew where the tornado was going to hit. He knew where the floods were going to come. The expert couldn't know that. He could tell me what it looked like physically. He was using his eyes to examine the building. And I believe he's a very smart man, and I, I trusted his advice on that part. But spiritually, I wanted God to say, this is the place you need to be at the right time and the right place, and this is where I want you. Amen? Not that I'm always right, but I took time to pray over this because it was a big decision in my life. And, and a lot of times we do that. We do that with big decisions, and the small decisions we don't even acknowledge God. Like AI. In the book of Joshua, we see a people who were focused on serving the Lord. At the beginning of Joshua, wasn't it amazing how, how as we go through the book of Joshua, we see, uh, you know, when, when we first started Joshua, these people were so focused on God. And if we could stay in that frame of mind, you know, it's kind of like a newborn Christian. When you're born again, man, when you, when you, get, when you come to the altar, you hear the name of Jesus Jesus forgives all your sins, and he washes you white as snow, and you get excited about serving Jesus, and you want to serve Jesus with all your heart. God was blessing them, God was leading them, and they were following. How good is that? Isn't that good? You know, we read this morning, we read the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. You know, if we could just do that, if we could just get that part of that verse down, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I'm going to let God lead me wherever he wants me to go. The Israelites, when they came in the book of Joshua, they started out and they said, listen, God is my shepherd. I shall not want. He will make me to lie down by green pastures. He is my hope. He is my force. He is everything. When I listen to him, things go right in my life, and I want him to lead me. Amen? The children of Israel had that. They had the power of God so that whenever they went anywhere, the power of God went before them and they followed. And when they had the power of God in their lives, the direction of God, they waited on God. God led them and they were willing and obedient to follow him. No enemy could stand before them. How, how good would it be if you could say, listen, no enemy that is formed against me shall prosper or stand. When we wait on God, we have that promise. When we wait for his voice, his direction, we have that promise. But when we step outside of his will and do our own thing in our own way, we have no promise of God to direct us because we've gone off and taken the driver's seat. It is clear when Israel followed God that none of the enemies could stand before him. But when sin entered in the camp, here's what happens. You're going along, you're following God. God's leading you, God's directing you, and everything you do, you're acknowledging God, and God is saying, this is the direction we should go. And all of a sudden, sin sticks its ugly nose inside your tent and says, can I just have a little breath of fresh air? And you say, well, what would it hurt? Young people? Listen to me, young people. What would it hurt? You're living for God. You're doing what's right. And you're minding your own business. You're waiting on God, and God is directing you, and God is powerful in your life. And the devil says, I need sin to stick its nose in that Christian's tent. Something pops up on your computer screen. Something pops up on your video screen on your phone. Just a little picture, and you say, what would it hurt if I let my mind rest, and my eyes rest on this, my mind meditate on this for just a moment? And you allow sin into your tent. 
And all of a sudden, you're no longer being directed and, and following God. Because sin does not, is not content with just its nose in the tent, is it? How many of us know that? That's how addiction starts. Letting a little bit of sin into your tent until there's no longer room for you. The Israelites had power with God because they were following God. Now there were strangers that had come into the camp and they had a the decision to make. Strangers from a faraway country came in and they said, listen, listen, let us just put our nose in the tent. We just want, we've come from such a faraway place. We have come from so far away. Listen, our, our garments are old. Our sandals are wore out. Our bottles are broke. Our bread is moldy. Listen, we come from so far. We can't harm you. We've heard all the things that God has done for you. Listen, they flattered them. They said, listen, God has done amazing things for you. We heard about Ah, king of Ashan, who you defeated. We heard about Jericho and the walls come tumbling down. We've heard that God is doing amazing things for you. Let us just stick our nose in your tent just for a moment. Get a breath of fresh air. Listen, we're so far away. By the time you get to us, by the time you get to us, we won't be any problem. What was the hurry? Was there a sale that was about to end? Is that what it was? Joshua and the children of Israel get together. They got all their counsel together. And they didn't ask counsel of the Lord. Because why? They were hurried in their decision. When we look back at Joshua chapter 1, you know, if we look back at Joshua chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, Joshua 1, 10 and 11, let's look back at Joshua, what he did when they were starting out. I believe it is important, I believe it's important that sometimes we need to look back at our Christian life when we started out, how on fire we were from God and what we were doing that was right, and we were growing. And sometimes in the Christian life, when you get away from God or you let sin in your tent, you stop growing. And sometimes you need to look back and say, why am I not growing? Why am I not doing the things that I did when I first became a Christian, when I first fell in love with Jesus? Let's look back a little bit. Joshua chapter 1, verses 10 11. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the host and command the people, saying, Prepare you victuals, for within three days ye shall pass over this Jordan, to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God giveth you to possess it. Three days is a very interesting number in the Bible. You know, I think when you have a big decision, we should take a few moments to understand how big is this decision, how can we get the experts to look at it and tell us the best advice they have, but ultimately, I want to wait on God, I want to seek God's will, and I want to understand what God has for me and what I should do according to God's word. Three days, very important, Numbers 10, 33, and they departed. I believe, you know, before, before I go on, Joshua commanded the officers and the people, and he said, listen, pass through the host, and I want you to command everybody. We're going to pass over Jordan, but it's going to be in three days. And I believe, he said, you need to prepare victuals. You need to prepare yourself. I think you need to sanctify yourselves. I think we need to spend this three days in prayer. The Bible doesn't tell us that, but I think it's very reasonable to think that's what they were doing. They were preparing victuals. They were preparing for the journey. And they were walking with God, and God was leading them, and they were waiting on God, and God said, we're going forward. Numbers chapter 10, verse 33, And they departed from the mount of the Lord three days' journey. And the ark of the covenant of the Lord went before them in the three days' journeyed to search out a resting place for them. Three days seems like a good amount of time to pray over a important decision. Esther, in Esther chapter 4, verse 16, she said, So gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day, I also and my maidens will fast likewise, and so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law, and if I perish, I perish. Did you see what she said? She said, neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. She said, listen, this is Esther. She said, you have asked me to go in and make a petition of the king that is in charge of my life. And before I go, I want you to gather all the Jews together to Shushan. I want you not to eat. I don't want you to drink. And I want you to fast. And I want you to pray for three days about this important decision that we are going forward to make. Why? She was waiting on God. She wanted God's will in this. 
She was saying, listen, no matter what happens, no matter what happens to me, this may cost me my life, but I'm not going to go and do this without the presence of God upon my life. I'm not going to do it without waiting on the presence of God. I'm not going to do it without God's direction. And if you'll get all the Jews together and me and my maidens will do the same thing and we'll fast and we'll pray for three days, God will deliver us. Because he's directed. And because we're waiting on the voice of the Lord. We're waiting on God. Are we waiting on God this morning? Jonah, Jonah didn't wait on God. God came to Jonah and said, I want you to go preach to Nineveh. Jonah ran from God. God said, I think he needs three days to pray about this running. Remember that? God says, I think he needs three days to wait on me. And God sent a big fish that swallowed Jonah whole, and he had three whole days and three whole nights to pray about this decision that he had made to run from God. And he made the right decision after he prayed for three days. If he would have taken three days before he ran from God, he might not have spent three days in the belly of the fish praying to God for deliverance from the fish who swallowed him. Amen? Amen. The, the fish bottomed up on dry land and said, God said, I think you need three more days to pray about this. It's three days' journey to Nineveh. You just pray all the day, and you just pray night and day in the belly of the whale, you can pray all the way to Nineveh. Because I don't think you're right with God yet. <laughs> we all know the story. He needed those, that time. He still needed time. Uh, you know, but Joshua... And the children of Israel listened to the voice of hurry, which is from the devil. Hurry. The sail ends soon. There's a limited supply. You've got to make your choice up right now. Young people, you're going to run across that all through your life. You have to make the decision today. When a salesperson tells you, listen, this offer ends soon, you need to be suspicious of that salesperson. Sales come and go. Good deals come and go. You have time to pray about it. If you don't have time to pray about it, you don't need it. A young boy comes in your life and pressures you. A young girl comes in your life and pressures you to do something you shouldn't do. You pray about it. That's the wrong person in your life. That's the wrong voice. That's the voice of the devil coming into your life. Joshua 9, 16, and it came to pass... I'm sorry, Joshua 9, 15 and 16. Let's read both of those. And Joshua made peace with them because he was in a hurry. The children of Israel were in a hurry. They, they decided to make a hurry decision. And Joshua made peace with them and made a league with them and to let them live. And the princes of the congregation swear unto them. And it came to pass at the end of three days, after they had made a league with them, that they heard that they were their neighbors and that they dwelt among them. Buyer's remorse set in really quick, three days later. What they should have done, what they could have done, was wait on the Lord. What do you do when you're waiting? What do we do when we're waiting on God? Have you ever wondered that? Because all of us ask things in prayer, don't we? All of us. We ask things in prayer. God is not a genie. So many times when you ask something in prayer, there's a time of waiting. What do we do when you're waiting? What does a waiter do? You ever thought about that? What does a waiter do? We don't think of waiting that way, do we? We think of sitting in a lobby, waiting for the doctor to say it's time to see me. And we're sitting there with our magazine, flipping through, just, just taking our time, just flipping through a magazine, the dentist's office, the doctor's office, waiting for somebody to call our name so we can go and get what we want, get what, 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 we're, what we're waiting for, to be seen. It's not the way it is with God. What does a waiter do? You know, we're supposed to wait on God. We should be like a waiter. A good waiter is patient. A good waiter is attentive to the voice of the one seated at the table. And a good waiter hears the request. Those are the things we need to do as Christians. You understand what I'm saying? We need to be waiting on God. We need to be patient in prayer. We need to be attentive to his voice. In other words, search the scriptures. We need to hear his request and be obedient to his voice. If Joshua had just done this, if he would have been a good waiter and waited on God, and as he was waiting on God, he would have been attentive. He would have been patient. He would have been attentive to God's voice. He would have been searching the scriptures daily. They wouldn't have made the decision they made. They would have understood 
through the Bible, through God's holy word, that they were not to make a league with these people. We make our decisions based on our feelings, like the, like the children of Israel who took the victuals and they held them and they touched them and they felt them, and then they made the decision based on how they felt about it. Never thinking about seeking and waiting upon God. And we do that, don't we? So many times we make decisions, seven decisions a day, 70 decisions a day, and we do it based upon our own limited knowledge when we have access to God who has all knowledge. How foolish is that? I think here's what I would have done. Well, this is maybe not what I would have done. Here's what, we're, we're, like I said last week, armchair quarterbacks. Here's what we should have done. Here's what Joshua should have done. Joshua should. The people came up and they said, listen, our victuals are old. Our garments are torn. Our bread is moldy. Uh, we've come from such a, strong, so, such a long, long way away. Uh, there's no way we'll be a threat to you. We will be your friends if you'll just make a league with us. Joshua said, listen, listen, here's what we're going to do. How far away are you? How many days journey are you? Oh, you're a year away. You're six months away. Here's what I want to do. I believe on waiting on God. God, I'm going to wait however long it takes to get to your village. And the whole time we're waiting, we're going to be praying. And as we're praying, we're going to be searching the scriptures to see what God says about making a league with you. And when we get there, we'll give you our decision. But there's no hurry to make a decision because, listen, we serve God who knows everything. And as I pray to God, listen, you have flattered me. You told me that you, you, you are afraid of us because we killed Ah king of Bashan, because we took down the walls of Jericho, but it wasn't us that did it. It was the God that we serve, and he can see past my mistakes, and he can see through my mistakes, and he can see over my mistakes, and he can see everything, and we're not going to make a decision till we hear from him because he knows you. You're strangers in this land. He knows you. I don't know you. He knows if those clothes are really old. I don't know. He knows if those bottles really broke the way you say or if they didn't. He knows if that bread is really moldy from the long journey or if you let it set for years before you brought it to us. And I refuse to make a decision based upon my limited intellect when I have a God who knows everything. Why should I make a quick decision about who to marry when God knows who she is and who she's going to be? Why should I make a decision on what house to buy when all I can see is the physical structure, but God can see everything? Why should I make a decision on a car I'm going to buy when the salesman's telling me something, but God knows more than the salesperson? Think about it. Why should I make the decision at all? The God I serve knows everything. And if I forget to ask counsel of him, if I forget to ask a word from him, it's my own fault when I have buyer's remorse. Amen? Joshua would have said that. Who would have been patient? He would have said, listen. Who would have been patient like they were when they crossed the Jordan, when they said, let's wait three days. If they would have waited three days, they would have heard that they were neighbors, that they were going to dwell among them. They wouldn't have fell into that pitfall of Satan. They wouldn't have allowed that sin to enter into the tent and get a breath inside their tent and kick them out. Joshua would have said this to the Hivites. He would have said, listen, I've searched the scriptures. I told you we're going to take some time. And now I've heard from the Lord God Almighty, and here's what he has to say. When I searched the scripture and I prayed to God, he gave me direction. I waited on him, and he gave me the word. And here's what he said. He says, ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. Ye shall throw down their altars. Because why? The Lord thy God commanded to serve as Moses to give us the land, to destroy all the inhabitants of the land before us. And God has told us not to make a league with you. Now listen, I serve a God who loves people, and he loves people, and he wants to save people. And instead of coming in here and trying to deceive us, you should have understood that the God we serve knows everything. And if you've heard that judgment is coming to your city, you need to repent and run. And I have a, I, I'm so faithful in God that if you would repent and run away from judgment and run to Jesus, he'll save you. But he won't save you by coming and trying to deceive me. He'll save you by allowing you to clear out of this land that God has given to us and to our generations forever. It's not your land. You need to move. They didn't have to make a, they didn't have to make a hasty decision. They didn't have to make a league with God's enemies. And these people still could have been spared. I believe that with all my heart. If these people would have been honest with God, 
honest with Joshua, I believe there would have been an agreement made between God and those inhabitants to save their lives. But Joshua and the children of Israel did not wait on God. They chose their own advice. They inspected the situation for themselves. They made their own hasty decision, not knowing the future or consulting the one who knows all things and who knows the future. They decided to do it on their own. They did it their way. And it came to pass, Joshua 9, 16, it came to pass at the end of three days after they had made a league with them that they heard that they were their neighbors and that they dwelt among them. You know, there's a story that I heard growing up, and I'm sure you probably already heard it, but some of you may have not have heard it. Uh, there was a camel and his owner. And many of you have heard the story about the camel and his owner. The camel and his owner were out in the desert, and a windstorm popped out of nowhere. The sand was whirling around. And as the sand whirled around, the owner of the camel got off his camel, and he made a tent. And we've seen those little pup tents that only one person can fit in. You know, it's just long enough, just tall enough for one person to get in. And he made this tent, and he quickly got into it as the sand was swirling around him, and all the sand was beating against him and his beast. And they, he got into his tent, and he zipped the tent door. And all of a sudden, it was quiet and still inside of his tent. The camel didn't like it. The camel, of course, was left outside, and as the violent wind hurled sand against his body and into his eyes and into his nostrils, he found it unbearable, and finally he begged for entrance into the tent. But the, the traveler said, there's only room for me in this tent. There's not room for you. But may I just stick my nose in your tent so that I can breathe a breath of breath, fresh air without all this sand? Well, the traveler thought for a minute, and he thought, well, I mean, if he puts his nose in, it won't hurt anything. I'm in my tent. It's all covered up. If I just unzip it just a little bit, he'll get his nose in there. He can get a breath of fresh air. That'll be fine. We'll leave it at that. And he, he acquiesced and he said, sure, camel, you can have a breath of fresh air. He unzipped his tent a little bit. In comes some sand. But then in came that big nose of that camel. Sucked up a big gulp of fresh air. Camel said, oh, this is good. Then he started to worry about his eyes. He said, well, well, perhaps you can open the flap just a little bit more because the eyes and my ears are getting hit with sand. The wind driven sand is a rasp on my head. Can you just open up just enough to get me to get my head in? I just want to get my head in the tent. Again, the traveler thought, well, he's already got his nose in. Might as well unzip it just a little bit more. He can get his head in the tent. His head can be up here on the top of the tent. I'm down below laying down. And I, there's enough room for that. Camel gets his head in the tent. Camel likes that. But he says, oh, oh, the rest of me, the rest of me. Can I just get my front quarters in, just my front legs, just my front legs? Because if I get my front legs in, th then it'll be a lot better. I'll feel a lot better. The traveler didn't want to, but he said, oh, okay, I guess I'll let you get your front legs in. The camel, camel was not happy with that. And he said, ah, uh, I need my hindquarters in, and if I get in the hindquarters in, I'll get my front legs and my back legs, and I'll be comfortable, and we'll both be happy. And the whole camel got inside the tent, and there was not room for the traveler, and he had to get out of his own tent. You see what I'm saying this morning? When you open the tent door, sin sticks his nose in, and it's never content to just have its nose in your tent. The strangers from a faraway land came. And they asked Joshua and the people, can we, can we just dwell among you? Can you just unzip the tent just a little bit? We'll just stick our nose in. Young people, the devil is saying, just unzip your tent just a little bit. Let me get a little sin in your life. We'll, I'll be content. I'll be content just to have my nose in your tent. We see this in churches, don't we? We see this in churches. The devil says, listen, if I can just get a little contemporary music in that church, if I can get a little psychedelic lice in that church, if I can get a little false doctrine in that church, I'll be content just to have my nose in that tent. Next thing you know, the whole camel has moved in. All, the devil has moved in, and, and, and Satan's people have moved in. They've taken over the church, and God's people have to flee, just like the traveler in the windstorm. Like the camel, the devil knows if he can get God's people to compromise with the world. And let the world's nose into God's tent. Soon the world will take over and God's people will be kicked out. That have, that'll happen in your life. That can happen in a church. That can happen in the country. We can't compromise with God's, with God's word. We can't compromise with the world. Bring them in thinking we're doing them a favor. Letting them get their nose in. Then their head in. 
then their front of their body in, then the rest of their body in when we get kicked out. The Hivites came to Joshua and said, can we just stick our nose in your tent? And Joshua and all Israel agreed it would not hurt anything. It would be okay. You know, sin has come to you and said, can I stick my nose into your tent? Some of you may have already compromised and allowed sin to put its nose in your tent. And it's starting to get more and more into your tent. And you're starting to be driven away. Your hope is Jesus. Jesus is the only one who can kick sin out of your tent. If you're unsaved, you need to come and get saved, and God will kick the devil out of your tent. If you're, if you're saved and you're backslidden and you got let sin get into your tent, Jesus is the only one who can come and deliver you from that sin. The question this morning, though, is, will you wait on God? Will you allow the one who knows everything to make your decisions, or will you make your own decisions? Seventy decisions a day. Seventy decisions a day are made on average. Are you making those decisions, or are you consulting with the one who knows everything? Because if you're not consulting with the one who knows everything, I guarantee you one thing, sin has its nose in your tent. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, we, we thank you, Lord, for another opportunity to meet together in this house. Thank you for another sermon. Thank you for the opportunity for another song of invitation. Thank you for another opportunity to pray. Our life is short, just a vapor. Eternity endless. Defeat the doubt in the unbelieving heart. Wake up the lost to their condition and draw them to Jesus. We ask for the sake of thy dear son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Ask for a song of invitation this morning.